afraid of the spy. The bigger the lie. Argyle being the, the big and splashy and happy film that it is, and it being a Matthew Vaughn project makes it all the better. But no, I love coming here for premiere. It's a big story that deserves a big viewing, and there are big things happening in it. And if you stay, you wait to watch it on the small screen, you're going to miss a lot. Oh my God! Hey. Do you like the Kingsman franchise? Do you like the movie Bullet Train? Do you like fun, comedic, charming, original, and action-packed espionage movies that don't require you and your mates to watch men in spandex beating up CGI monsters? Or poorly choreographed fight sequences of women taking down a battalion of men twice their size? Or dive into a cheesecake menu level of world building, lore, and character backstory? Oh, wait you do? Hmm, me too. Well, do I have the perfect movie recommendation for you? Well, at least half of one. Argyle, or I'll probably call it Agent Argyle sometimes in this video because I swear I'm being affected by some sort of Mandela effect where I truly believe that that was definitely the marketed name at some point. Point is, Argyle is the type of movie where I feel like everybody clamors for on social medias under the headlines of, oh, we don't get enough original ideas anymore, or, Oh, Hollywood creativity is dead, or oh, the IPs are taking over. You know, statements along those lines, which I am definitely guilty of as well. But a movie where, yet again, when the general audience is asked to put their money where their mouth is, well, we're left with what I showed you in the cold open of the video. And the cycle of pain just continues on and on and on again for the lot of us that actually go to the movies to not support trash. It's truly over. And don't get me wrong, in no way am I saying that Argyle is a perfect movie, or really genuinely a great movie. It was a movie that was heavily held back by its own grandiose vision, massive tonal shifts, questionable pacing, and of course, pretty blatant and I don't want to say for sure, but it almost seems like purposeful mismarketing. Which is pretty much a triple negative for almost everybody involved, including the studios, the actors, and the audience. But we'll get to that, because in the same breath, you could also easily describe Argyle as a funny and unserious espionage flick that delivers outlandish but still grounded action sequences, charming and relatable characters, effective and engaging plot twists, and an actual fun time at the movie theater that doesn't make you feel as if you've wasted your hard-earned money time, and brain cells, which is no longer a guarantee anymore when it comes to the big screen. And while I have absolutely no idea how this movie ballooned to a budget of your typical multiverse saga Marvel movie, I will definitely say for sure that it wasn't for lack of effort when it comes to Argyle's financial downfall. But that's enough yapping. Unlike the movie itself, we're trying to avoid pacing problems here, so much like Kelly Conway, let's dive into... Huh, I should probably make this short and to the point because I don't want to sit here for 30 minutes and describe three separate movies for you. Argyle follows Kelly Conway, an author with a habitual problem of not writing endings to her stories or writing relatively shitty ones, definitely reminds me of a couple people that I know, whose action spy thrillers starring Agent Argyle start to hit a little too close to home and become her new reality. And it's unfortunate because even while typing this script, I realize the short and to the point method is going to be pretty hard because this movie has absolutely no structure. And I also realize that I'm not helping my case. So for the sake of spoilers and mostly time, for the majority of the movie, you're mostly looking at a pretty standard, relatable and funny buddy spy movie. And that's honestly where the movie was at its best because from then on, I don't think Argyle could tell its head from its own ass. From ridiculous plot twists that change the entirety of the narrative and character relationships, to over-the-top action sequences sprinkled in more and more as the runtime goes along, almost as if it's a Matthew Vaughn movie. Definitely not his best work, but definitely not his worst. But that's probably the best you're going to get from me. And hey, 
At least I didn't miss market to all of you, so... Okay, so as much as the mismarketing of certain actors playing certain characters, or I guess the mismarketing of certain actors and their roles in the film, is going to be a continuing theme throughout this video, I can say that Sam Rockwell and the Dinosaur Lady did do a pretty solid job. The comedy never left throughout the entirety of the movie, and that's mostly contributed to the on-screen chemistry of our two fraudulent leads. In a time where on-screen romantics have been a dramatically decreasing writing and character element in our Hollywood blockbusters, as well as Sidney Sweeney trying to revive the genre of the rom-com, it was refreshing to watch two characters genuinely develop together throughout their journey and form a connection that they were both looking for at the end. And while I mentioned and described before that the action sequences were either over the top or ridiculous, that doesn't mean that I was inherently saying that that was a bad thing. And honestly, it's quite the opposite. The majority, if not all of the actors involved, seem to be actually enjoying themselves, which again, is not a privilege that we audiences are so privy to nowadays. How many times do you find yourself saying something along the lines of, oh, that was just a turn-in performance, or well, that paycheck must have been nice. I'm just saying that that is not the case here. And if there's one thing that I can guarantee, no matter how minor or major the role might have been, you'll surely enjoy yourself from the character performances alone. And while you might feel bamboozled around 15 minutes into the movie, around 30 minutes in, Ellie Conway already has you invested. Oh, and the plot twists were actually good. And most of the time, pretty unexpected. Again, the character writing is what Argyle had when it was at its best, but there were some negatives too. Okay, so we have two issues here. One, Argyle is going to heavily flop. And while yes, we the audience were led astray when it comes to the two leading actors for the movie, in the same regard, does that not mean that Henry Cavill isn't box office? Fuck. It's unfortunate because Dua Lipa makes sense, but my boy, like, no way, man. I feel like this is starting to happen way too often and I don't want my mans to get a stigma that he's not box office. But stepping away from the casting mismanagement, there's absolutely no reason why Argyle had to be two hours and 20 minutes. Two hours tops, if that. But that problem really highlights the major issue, and an issue that is now starting to become a plague in major studio blockbusters, the pacing. While I believe tonal shifts are easier to manage due to the character element going hand in hand, pacing is truly just a reflection of one's vision. And the vision here was dragged out so much longer than necessary. But that's what happens when your vision is basically a Frankenstein's monster of three movies wrapped in one, with no balls, structure, or additional eye to look over said work in order to make the tough calls, or say what to leave on the cutting room floor, or hopefully if caught early enough, avoid the Madam Web route of having to reshoot the entirety of your movie and avoid the bad idea of hitting the page altogether. And while I believe characters and character writing is truly the most important element when it comes to entertainment, unfortunately, I can't say the characters here were strong enough of a foundation to keep this movie afloat. But still, compared to the unrealistic but cinemized realism, I don't know if that's a word, but it's starting to make me believe in something even more important but sinister conclusion that I truly didn't and don't want to believe. Have audiences lost track of escapism? While the cinematic aspect of escapist entertainment has been a lost art and concept for Hollywood for quite some time now, I didn't believe that we were anywhere close to that when it comes to the audience side of the table, and while they always say that it's going to get worse before it gets better, these are the type of ideas that truly make the cinematic landscape or say, change in the cinematic landscape in regards to the seemingly never-ending tidal wave of sequels, requels, reboots, and IP brand destruction take an even stronger grip on our present reality. But is that what we want? There is just no world where Argyle is a bad movie. Ant-Man Quantum Dumbass was a bad movie. Indiana Jones and the Dial of Dipshit was a bad movie. 
The Flash was a bad movie. But Argyle? I don't know. I just don't know about that. So I'll leave you with this question. Is the escapist aspect when it comes to big screen entertainment gone? Of course, as always, I want to thank you guys for watching the video. And if you enjoyed, make sure to hit that like button and subscribe to the channel for more videos like this. I'm not going to tell you how to spend your money. To be honest, I'm more concerned for my boy Henry Cavill's image. We're missing out on a good one. I should say follow me on Twitter. I started a whole new account for this channel, so I'm going to start promoting that more. Again, I want to thank you guys for watching the video. Make sure to like and subscribe. If you did enjoy, why not click on more while you're at it? Otherwise, that's all the words I got for you today. Bye.